Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Marc-André Labondé. I'm here to talk about the Black Bear Project, which is um, basically a fork of OpenSSH. Um, I, made, I made that fork to uh, transform OpenSSH in a reverse SSH shell. Uh, so um, I was a system administrator for more than 10 years and uh, since two years ago uh, I moved away to uh, penetration testing and that is what I'm doing ever since. Um, so yeah, why I did it and I, I'm gonna talk about why I did it and uh, how I did it especially. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, fork of OpenSSH. Uh, it's designed to provide a fully interactive shell. Uh, don't know if you tried like the dev TCP bash trick or uh, web shells or uh, Python reverse shells. Uh, when you're using those shells, um, some command may not work properly like top or vi or even sudo. So I, I wanted a regular SSH shell as a reverse shell when I, I need to, uh, to do a connect back. And also uh, I wanted to leverage uh, OpenSSH uh, dynamic and uh, port forwarding like uh, the SOX proxy and the VPN uh, functionality and the regular um, remote uh, reverse port forwarding and the regular port forwarding as well, which you won't have if you do a, like a dev TCP in batch. Uh, so um, a bit of history about the project. Uh, it started uh, when the, the Hackfest event used to have war games. Uh, the, the last two war games were uh, playing countries by fighting each other. And the first such war games, I was kicked out of my home machine by uh, some adversary team. I saw never again, so I started to fork OpenSSH to provide me with some sort of backdoor uh, that I could use also defensively. So if uh, some adversary in a war game will um, infiltrate my machine and uh, change all the password and uh, replace all the authorized key uh, uh, with my SSH fork SSH server, I will still be able to log in and fight back. And then uh, the first version was based on uh, OpenSSH, and, but uh, it lacked the reverse shell functionality. Then I forked DropBear, the DropBear uh, project. That's why it's called BlackBear. And so the code base is simple, so I could understand the code and uh, add the reverse shell functionality, but DropBear do lack uh, the SUX proxy for dynamic port forwarding, so I went back to OpenSSH. Uh, I was, uh, became a better programmer, so I was able to finally understand OpenSSH and uh, finish the job. Um, so that's uh, the, yeah, the functionality, uh, talk about it, like uh, you have to know that you could use uh, these options to, um, let's say, uh, you want uh, to use an additional service on the target side, uh, you will use the capital L option to open a port on your machine that if you connect to it, it will, be, uh, it will go through the SSH tunnel, then you will be able to reach the service on the remote machine. Because otherwise, a firewall uh, might prevent that connection. Uh, you may also uh, provide services to the remote machine through your connection. Let's say you have a connect back, but from a network that doesn't have access to the internet, and you need uh, machines uh, from the network to have internet access, uh, you can use the capital R option to open a port on the target side. If uh, the target side connected, there will be four forward it to your machine, and then you can uh, tunnel to a proxy and give internet access to the otherwise uh, enclosed uh, restricted network. Uh, so that uh, these uh, functionality, I, I wanted to have them in 
inside my uh, reverse shell. Uh, so of course, uh, it's a post exploitation tool, so you have to uh, have the ability to run code on the target machine. Uh, so you have to have an exploit or a login or some way to run code remotely. And uh, like I said, pr uh, provides the tunneling ability. And I use it uh, for manual enumeration, like uh, since I have a regular SSH shell, I can run VI, I can run top, I can run any tools that could be on the machine, uh, I use it to manually explore uh, machines. So yeah, I talked about that already. Uh, so fully interactive shell. All right. Uh, so the issues that I encountered in uh, the development of the, the software, it's like um, uh, I encountered uh, what they call the privilege uh, separation. Uh, privilege separation is when uh, the SSH server receive a connection is um, going to fork into two processes, and it's meant to um, uh, provide security to prevent uh, someone that is reaching the server from the, net, uh, the network uh, to, to reduce the attack surface. So what will happen is when you connect to the uh, SSH uh, server, server will fork and then the network code will be, uh, will drop privilege and will change route so it will have restricted access to the file system and then it will be uh, uh, further restricted with uh, technology like SecComp on Linux or uh, Pledge on OpenBSD uh, that will restrict the, the system calls that can be made uh, from that uh, process, that restricted process. And another process will be created, uh, that is the privilege one, and that uh, privilege process will be responsible uh, for authenticating the user so it will uh, receive the password or receive a uh, credential and the authentication tokens uh, or it will challenge if um, the user is using a key pair will challenge the user to prove it has the required private key uh, and both processes do communicate with each other more on that later uh, that could be abused as well uh, and also, I, I did try not to use the, the disk on the target side, so I did want to bypass uh, any uh, account restriction. Let's say you are attacking a web server. Uh, the account the web server is running on often has its shell set to uh, bin files or bin login, and there are also uh, other configuration to restrict uh, access to those uh, system accounts. So I wanted to bypass that. And I wanted to leave as little log as possible. And uh, I wanted not to depend on uh, the target authentication mechanisms. So I don't use the target password databases. I don't use uh, authorized key on the target. Actually, uh, the authentication is done uh, with a key pair, but the public key uh, is embedded inside the binary. It's not on a, it's on the binary that you will upload, but not on the target server. And uh, finally, uh, this issue is when I do uh, upload the SSHD binary to the target, I have to upload it, and then to toggle the execute, execute bit on the binary, like do change mod on it, and then to run it with uh, proper arguments. So uh, I wanted to streamline that process. So I discovered that uh, I could uh, also make the SSHD a bash script. So uh, it, it's a bash script and an ELF file at once. So the bash script that is embedded in the binary will take care of the uh, ch change mode, will turn on the execute bit, then uh, run it with the supplied arguments. So first, um, the privilege operation that I talk about, uh, it's like uh, will fork with 
would for both uh, two processes. Uh, one that is uh, talking with the network, that is heavily restricted uh, ch change route with second and force, and uh, the other privileged process, uh, which is called the monitor. Most of the privileged process code is in the monitor.c file. And uh, these two communicate over a defined protocol uh, over a Unix socket. And um, it might surprise people, but the information that is uh, sent and received over that socket is in the clear. So if you try to eavesdrop the network uh, on the, the right side, uh, the information is encrypted. But uh, if you attempt to eavesdrop on the Unix socket that connect both the privileged and the unprivileged process, then you will have access to uh, clear text credentials. Um, so how it works is um, in the privilege, uh, the unprivileged process, uh, the code will call uh, mm request send to send data over the socket. And then the privilege process will receive that request with the credential, will validate, and will uh, answer um, with mm answer or password to say if the account is authenticated or not if the, after uh, the, the password has been validated. But uh, we can eavesdrop on that. Um, you can test with uh, the PS and the SS tools. So um, this screen capture has been made uh, right after a client do connect, but before the user actually enter the password. So let's say you, uh, you have root access on a machine, and from another machine, you, uh, you connect to it with SSH. You'll get the password prompt. You don't enter anything. You go back on your on your machine, uh, and uh, you use PS. You'll see um, the the two SSHD child processes. Uh, the privilege one, uh, you'll see priv within square brackets, and the the network part of it, you'll see net into the uh, square brackets. So you can get the PID uh, 1360 for the privilege one and 30. 1361 for the uh, network code. And using the SS tool, uh, you can enumerate, enumerate uh, Unix sockets uh, you, uh, yeah, that are used uh, by these processes. So from the privilege size, the file descriptor of the socket is the file descriptor 6. And uh, from the network side, is, it is file descriptor 4. So then you see the pipe that does link the two. And I made quite a few experiments. And uh, if I monitor the privilege uh, process to try to gather credential, I notice that the file descriptor, which I can get them from, is pretty much always six. Uh, might be different, but uh, in my experience, I got uh, a lot of success with six. So you can gather credential, um, like let's say overnight, over a few days, uh, for as long as you want. And uh, you can do it with S-Trace if it did, it's installed on the machine. Uh, you can also do it with other tools. There is a tool, uh, it's called TreeSnake. Uh, it's like built-in routed. And uh, that tool will do it, will extract password and show you the password automatically. But um, I prefer to use S-Trace if it's already installed. And I will uh, avoid to upload the binary on the machine. And the point is, your root already, it's like if you can do that, that means that you, you already uh, compromise that machine. But uh, what you want to do is to collect and perhaps reuse credentials. So you wait uh, for a system administrator to log in. Uh, so yeah, demo time. So uh, it's uh, this one. So 
So I'm, uh, I'm root already on the virtual machine. It's like uh, the, the high P is uh, 192, 168, 122, 17. And then I look for the PID of the main SSHD daemon. So that's the one that is actually listening on port 22. Uh, often you'll see, uh, if you grab for SSHD, you'll see a lot of SSHD processes. Uh, you want to target that one uh, that is listening to the main service port. So I'm running as trace, and then I'm logging in as sysadmin. Uh, I use a long password. Passwords are getting longer and longer these days. <laughs> so I'm typing the password in. And then what, as I hit enter, uh, it generates a, a lot of logs files. Uh, so I, I grab for SSH connection to locate the file in which the credential will be logged. And uh, when you find that string inside the uh, S-trace, the, the log file that will be generated by S-trace, uh, you look for that string and the password will be a few line uh, below. So here it is. <laughs> so that's how uh, one can abuse privilege uh, separation of open SSH. So back to the slides. All right, so then um, I wanted to avoid the disk on the target side and also uh, avoid uh, logging and uh, login restriction. So I disable uh, the no login check. So it's like there's a configuration file, you can uh, deny access to some user in SSHD, so I disable that. So if my SSHD daemon runs on a server, even though that file is there and defined all in your earth. And uh, also, I'll always make sure the, sh the shell that you'll get uh, is bin SSH. Uh, I wanted to use bash, I prefer bash, but I'm not sure bash is present on all systems, so uh, I thought it was safer to use bin SSH. Uh, it's, uh, ND, if the shell of the user that is compromised is, let's say, triple W data, and whose shell is no login. Um, like I said, uh, the authorization is done with uh, uh, public keys, uh, and uh, the key uh, is embedded in the binary. So uh, I modified the make file, so when you build a project, it will generate a key pair, uh, which I'll call ID black bear, and it will create a C file, pubkeys.c. Uh, we see it here, and it will embed the public key in a character array. Uh, do notice the no pointer at the end, that is well tell my, my, my code to stop looking for keys, so you can add your own keys and rebuild but uh, make sure that no pointer is there. Um, I did replace the usual uh, code that is designed to read keys from authorized key file disk with that function, read key file man, which read keys from the array. Uh, so that's how authorization worked with BlackBear. Um, also, the configuration of the SSH daemon uh, is also embedded. Uh, you can modify it by editing uh, surfconf.c and recompile. Uh, so that's, uh, that way I don't have to rely on configuration file on the target side. And uh, I also turn on uh, you know, the gateway port option when you use uh, capital R to expose a port on a target side and to forward it on your side, um, usually by default you're, you are restricted to the look-back interface. So you cannot, uh, let's say your target uh, as a, 
network interface and they will expose other network. You cannot serve a port to these networks. You can only serve to look back. So I turn gateway port on. So with Black Bear, you can expose port on all uh, network interfaces on the remote system. Uh, finally, um, like yeah, the the old skis uh, are generated on the fly. That's a remnant of the whole design. Um, so I didn't want to use whole skis on disk. So I copied code from the SSH key gen. Uh, you know that that part is responsible for generating key pairs that be uh, old skis or user keys. So I copied the generate the code responsible for key generation into the SSHD binary. But uh, there is one big issue is that like you'll never know uh, if the, the host key is good or not. So that makes the software vulnerable to man the middle attack. Um, so uh, I recently developed uh, the code for compile time generation of user keys. So I should use the same course, the same code for uh, all keys as well. That, that is a fix that is coming. Um, and I wanted to um, have to deliver more effectively the binary. So I was tired of downloading. Uh, it's like let's say you have a web shell, you have to send a request download the binary, send a second request to uh, turn on the executable bit, and then send the third request to run the binary with the arguments you want. So I wanted to streamline that process. So I found a way to include a bash script inside the ELF binary, uh, sort of like the uh, proof of concept or get the fuck out publication are doing with their magazines. It's like it's a polyglot file or a file can be a multiple type at once. So I did look at the ELF header to find places where I could uh, include uh, my shell script. And if you try to, first I've tried to pipe uh, my SSHD binary into bash and then I noticed that it will fail but uh, later uh, it's like it will go through like uh, the first 300 bytes and it will fail uh, at the first parenthesis uh, it, it will encounter. So uh, bash can actually uh, is actually permissive uh, so it will absorb a lot of different bytes before it will bail out for a syntax error. So I did, I did profit from that, and I also did profit from the fact that uh, inside the ELF file editor, uh, um, several bytes that are unused. So I use that small amount, small amount of space as a code cave to include uh, an here document. So I used the here document to make bash. When I pipe SSHD, I make it ignore whatever is between my here document inside the file editor and the closing tag of the here document right before my script that I include as another character array. So we see here, uh, I wrote a Python script that will patch SSHD to add the here document inside the ELF file header. And uh, the, the lower part of the screen capture is in the river shell.c file. I added a character array, which include the closing part, uh, then the actual bash script that will receive arguments from the environment and it will uh, turn on the execute bit, then uh, run the, the SSHG binary. So that's, that is when the ELF takes over. So demo time. 
ねdash r flag to specify a listen address so that's that tells the client that that I will need to listen for a connection instead of trying to make a connection and also I included uh, an example uh, in the readme.md file that I will use uh, against the web server so I invoke the client you have to specify the key just I as you will do usually, and I, I oh, just made a mistake. Uh, I need to use dash p. The regular dash p will allow you to specify the port. So then the client is listening for a connection. I just copy and paste the command inside the damn vulnerable web application. And when I hit submit, I get a connect back, then from there, uh, the, uh, the usual SSH protocol takes place. So it's only reverse TCP, then it's regular SSH. So I'm triple W data. Uh, I can see my shell is user bin, no login, but I, I got bin SSH. I can run top, I can run thin, and it's like, just like I had a regular SSH connection. So that's pretty much it. Any questions? <laughs>